see about 10 here so far. Yeah, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Since we have up to 13, and that's about the same number we had the first time after we had our uh, wonderful technology uh, handling of it. We did not do a good job. It looks like we've done a little bit better job this time around. So I wanted to thank everybody for joining. Last time we tried this, it took maybe 45 to 50 minutes, and I would expect it to take about that this time, too. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. If you do have any questions, there is a way to indicate uh, interest or a question, and then we can uh, unmute you on here, either John or I can. Probably John, because I'll be too busy trying to think about the next thing I want to talk about. So this is describing the SSD forecast blog. Um, in, let's go to the next page. All right, it is in VLAB, and if you select the, it looks like kind of the no eye option under uh, PRSU. I think anybody can post to it, and I've seen a forecaster post to it. So I, I believe that's the case. So then if you go down under um, the second circled area I have here, under the forecast, uh, the, this red area, the forecast, and that will take you straight to the blog. There's also a forecast links underneath that, which I'll show in just uh, towards the end of the call. Um, that is a list of links um, that I'm turning into a table that shows all the various sources that we're using for this forecast blog. I probably should have also circled this add blog entry down here in the lower left. That is the starting point for adding to this blog. Now you may or may not have the edit option above that. If you do, don't use it. <laughs> Um, the way you want to add something to the blog is to use that add blog entry. Our motivation for doing this was to take a deeper look at some of the newish tools, newish if you will, um, to help identify anomalous events in this old DSS environment. We initially identified it as a medium range forecast blog, but later opened it to any time scale. We're not going to manage to make a post on this about every high impact event that affects the central region. Workload and our availability will dictate that and our judgments as well. Um, it's sometimes hard to know whether a potential event is worthy of a post. As you may have noted, we haven't posted in a few weeks. Um, some of that's scheduling, some of that's just weather getting a little bit quieter. Um, a little bit more active within Northern Plains now, so I was actually thinking about doing something here soon, but I've also been preparing for this. So, um, if you guys see an event you think is worthy of covering, please feel free to make a post in the blog. One part that I haven't figured out is if it becomes pretty active, how to keep parallel efforts from happening, but perhaps that won't become an issue. I'm definitely still learning these sites. I'm probably closer to clueless than I am of like possessing any level of expertise on it. But I've probably reached a level of familiarity enough to not turn this presentation into a bumbling disaster, which I, I truly hope it's not. I want to look at six primary sites. I realize I only have four in the quad here because it looks much better on, on, on PowerPoint. Um, and they told me in an eighth grade speaking class that you're supposed to start with your best information and end with either your second best or also best information. So, so the first site I'm going to visit is the uh, Ezra's reforecast data, which is a panel here in the upper right. I um, also want to look at the one on the lower left here, which is uh, came from Columbia University and the SPC has now kind of, kind of hosted it, um, the severe weather parallelogram. The bottom right is Hanford's model trend page, and I won't spend a lot of time on that, um, but I do want to cover it. The uh, What may be the godfather of forecast analog type stuff, and that is SLU's uh, SIP analog from St. Louis University. Also, two more that I don't have on here. I want to look at the uh, SPC Mars output as well as the NCON ensemble. And again, there's no doubt in my mind that some of you guys have used these more than I have. Um, so you may have a greater appreciation for some of the nuances involved. So please jump in and point out something if you see we have overlooked something or there's something you've noticed in the past that you want to mention. But again, I want to start by looking at the Ezra Reforecast data page. And you get bonus points for seeing the strange little goblin in the image that I posted there in the bottom right. Something 
thing I captured, I think, in uh, April when I was initially putting this together. Um, but I've, I've have a growing affinity for the Ezreal reforecast data. They are a little bit lower resolution, but as I'm understanding it, as I understand it, they are effectively calibrating the uh, GIF's output with historical analogs by identifying and correcting forecast errors based on a 30-year database. Their page mentions, and I'm quoting, dramatically increasing the forecast skill while noting that improvements may be particularly large for medium range forecasts and for forecasts of relatively uncommon events such as heavy precip. One of the things I like about this is it is somewhat of a filter for the garbage in, garbage out thing, um, which can affect the, the flu analogs, but this one with the, with the uh, reforecast calibration, it eliminates some of the poorer input by using that historical database. One limitation, again, is the resolution. It is run at a 50 kilometer resolution. Um, so then there are four main points I want to look at on the Ezreal page. The first of which is the precip uh, forecast, and that's just a uh, an amount or actualized probabilities in there as well. The third bullet on there is the uh, high resolution precip forecast. And I haven't ignored the second bullet, but I haven't seen a substantial difference between uh, the output on the second and third ones there. And again, we're going to go to the site here pretty, pretty shortly. Um, I'll admit I don't know what a censored shifted gamma distribution is. Or, yeah, let me correct that. The CSGD stands for censored shifted gamma distribution, the parametric method. So whatever that means. It sounds complicated, so it's got to got to be good, right? Um, the uh, third thing on there is the probabilistic temperature stuff, which I found pretty valuable during our multiple freeze and frost events of late March and early April this past spring, or this most recent spring. I guess we're technically still in spring, but it's summer. <laughs> um, speaking of summer, it, some of the uh, probabilistic temperature stuff may be useful during uh, heat waves, um, and certainly then to um, the uh, cold events during the cold season. The fourth thing on there is the tornado probabilities, um, which are pretty interesting. I, I had a chance to talk to SPC a little bit about it, and they have found it to be really more of a supercell indicator than a true tornadic potential. Um, so we will look at those four sites. So let me, hopefully this jumps to my browser, and we'll go to the uh, precipitation forecast. And let's see if this will update for me. I have all this cached, so it'll load reasonably quickly. Okay, we're still, this is still based upon output from um, 9 June, as you may see there, and it's the 0Z zero zero run. Usually by this time of the day, you will see uh, the most recent run, which should be 0Z zero zero from the 10th. That's not the case today, so we still have a little bit to work with. Um, I want to try using what I think would be the right time frame here to capture uh, Precip over the northern plains today with their active weather up there. And so this would be then the, as it says there, the deterministic precip from those analogs. Just no more than what those analogs uh, would predict for um, basically this 24 hour period, uh, 12Z this morning through 12Z tomorrow morning. Um, and it's hitting the, the area that I, if I recall correctly, SPC has outlooked. Um, you can also, oops. You can also look at it in terms of probability, um, probability of getting more than, in this case, a tenth of an inch. And hopefully that generates, there it comes. Um, and lo and behold, you know, pretty good precip chances there. Down near uh, us here in KC, not so much so, but maybe a slight chance of seeing something. Don't want to spend too much time on the deterministic probability. Um, I do want to jump to this high resolution uh, precip forecast, and the setup is largely the same, although there is an animation here, and I've kind of found myself um, trending towards using the animation quite a bit. Um, I think that was, let's see, was that a tenth of an inch I think I've loaded? Um, over the next week, basically. So I'll let this sucker load and then step through it. Okay, um, so there is yesterday, because this is the ninth 
and there it is on the night. Okay, so then there is today, and stepping through it. And again, this is probability of having more than a tenth of an inch of precip from um, the analogs here. And whoops, let's step back to that. There's the seemingly active event for uh, the Saturday night into Sunday morning for the far northern plains. And maybe a little hope for those of us down here in the southern part of Western Core early next week. Um, I found this to be pretty good. Like I said, most of this site is, is pretty good. I, I found the reliability, if you will, um, pretty good. Um, let's see here. What else do I want to show on this? Also, then, you can see the um, various, various levels as well as percentiles, probability of exceeding you know, 90th percentile, that type thing. Um, but I don't want to delve through all those. You guys have to dig through those. There's still a lot I want to show on here. But again, this has been this has been pretty good and pretty reliable. I want to jump now to the temperature stuff. And let's load the 850 temperature. And it's you can do it in the short term and longer term. I usually find myself going to the longer term. Um, and in this case, uh, fortunately, at least for around here, it looks like we're not going to get too hot too soon. Is that uh, little upper low kind of tends to look like in the uh, determinist model cuts off a little bit. So it's showing for the probability of 850 temps for most of central region, with the exception of our friends in the Outland Rockies, to be at or maybe slightly below normal. Um, let's see, so the left one there is the tercile, and then just the ensemble mean anomaly. Um, over the right. Nothing, you know, nothing real attention grabbing for either one of those. And then, of course, you can look out a little bit further out, which I'm guessing is a little bit warmer, still warmer for Boulder's area. Um, a little bit cooler with that, that weakness in the uh, upper pattern for, for the uh, lower Mississippi Valley, lower Ohio Valley there. Um, well, the one thing I want to spend just a little bit more time on um, for this versus the temperature stuff. <laughs> Excuse me, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, um, a question from Jeff Craven. Um, he was asking about possibly showing the difference between the raw GEFs ensemble forecast and the calibrated reforecast. Um, oh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. He said it might be good for complex terrain like Cascades, maybe in the Rockies, possibly. Let's see, that's in the, was that in the high, which one was in that? The high resolution precip one? I can't remember. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, uh, Jeff's uh, muted right now. Oh, okay, I think he just said it's in the first one. It is one. in the first one, yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. I wish I could hear him. It would be easier. Um, so let's see. Let's try that same time period. Ah, that's what he showed. That's what he's asking about. Is the that second graphic on there, which I kind of skipped by, has that difference between the deterministic analog and the uh, ensemble mean raw from the guess. Um, not a lot of difference here, um, but you do see times where it jumps out pretty pretty substantially. All right, did I cover that? <laughs> Gloss over it enough? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, let's go to the tornado probability one. And I've found myself just being pretty lazy on this one and jumping straight to all 10 days just to see, you know, what the chances are for the next, for that time period. And this is, again, based upon the analogs, the tornado probabilities for the next 10 days. And let me maximize my screen here. I hope that will make it a little easier to see. Um, so it highlights, let's see, that's the, okay. This would be today's, this one, this second panel. Um, and the values aren't terribly high here. Um, so look through the rest of the weekend into early next week. And they jump up a little bit here towards, I guess that would be Tuesday next week with a uh, little short wave coming out. A little, you know, fairly compact little short wave, or a uh, little short wave coming out that jumps the tornado probabilities up into these, you know, five to maybe pushing 10% type thing, kind of the last gasp for, for uh, severe weather here in the southern part of the region. Um, it doesn't really, you know, grab your attention until you start getting to the yellows and reds here. Um, but for mid-June, it's, it's, not, it's not terribly bad. 
Um, then, of course, you can look at any individual time frame. Um, let's look at days. And that will give you, again, then the tornado probabilities there in the upper left, um, as well as here in the lower left, which is the uh, putting together the cape and the shear, as well as the spin, um, and putting that into a quantile. Um, and this is, again, for today. So it's kind of sort of highlighting um, the northern plains as the SPC has outlook. And again, I don't get too crazy about it until it gets, you know, again, into the yellows and reds. Um, again, then this is then based upon, uh, I think it's then compared to climatology. So um, it would, uh, you need, you know, capes, you know, higher than just, you know, we'd regularly have this time of year, as well as this year. I don't know what contribution thin makes here, whether it makes a positive or, con or negative contribution to it. Perhaps they're using even, you know, like a, uh, you know, a perfect window of, you know, like minus 10 to minus 25, 10 or something like that. I, but again, I don't know if that makes a positive or negative contribution to those, those uh, quantiles. Um, let's see, anything else here? I have not spent a lot of time looking at the uh, panels there on the right. Um, but you can read through them, see what they represent. Um, I think that's all I wanted to do on this particular site, unless there's any questions about the the uh, Azure reforecast data. All right, I will jump back to my presentation then, and we will start talking about the Severe Weather Guidance Dashboard, or I sometimes call it the very busy parallelogram. Whoops, dang it, happy mouse there. Um, at first look, this graphic can be a little tough to decipher, even overwhelming. Um, it's run from the CFS, so it is lower resolution, 56 kilometers in the horizontal, I think. But it's still a pretty interesting way to view what days over the next month or so could be active from a severe weather perspective. Viewing the data in the aggregate form here in the parallelogram is probably the best way to you know, paint the complete picture. But closer is in inspection is available where needed. So let's go ahead and jump to the site and hope it loads. It sometimes is just a touch slow to load. I'm hoping it's reasonably cached in my browser here because I did look at it earlier. Um, of course, it's not cooperating here. So hopefully here, I think while it loads, I will go. Okay, here it comes. Um, all right, so trying to explain all this. The current day is a little tough to see, but it is highlighted by this, this kind of this bright, this white line in here. Um, the colorful columns, if you will, the you know the darker yellows and oranges, um, and those with a lot of X's. And you want the, the best way to look at it is in the columns for today. This is the column we're interested in, and it, it's it's more colorful on average. Um, than say some of the others. Um, so those colorful columns with a lot of X's can be interpreted as a day that the CFS has consistently depicted a higher probability for severe weather for that 24 hour period. The most recent run then is this horizontal line on the top. Um, and again, we have the colorful X's um, during the first part. And then as we get toward, let's see, that would be uh, July, it gets pretty darn quiet. So June probably active over the northern plains, um, probably the Rockies, and then we get you know, pretty quiet in July. So um, that to me suggests, you know, death ridge moving in, <laughs> not much flow. Um, so then the boxes, the individual little boxes, are framed in white when at least 100 of the 845 grid points over the CONUS have an average supercell composite parameter, the SCP, of 1 or greater for the day. Now, that value used to be 50, but they adjust it, I think, seasonally, so now it's 100. Um, and I think this model jumps from 18 to 0 Z, so it's possible that you may miss the portion of the day with the greatest surface space sensibility. Um, 
which obviously contributes to the SVP parameter. So it's possible um, that the numbers should be just slightly higher than what they show. What I found is it's, it's a, they're pretty busy graphics anyway. So it's it's mostly you know it serves its purpose with just doing 18 and zeros and ones. Okay, so then the boxes, the X's, um, the boxes are filled with X's. When any grid point in the 24-hour period has an SVP of five or greater, I probably should get the full graphic off of here because I do want to move to that in a moment. Um, so yeah, those boxes just represent the X's represent five or greater F on the SVP. Then they're filled in with a color corresponding to the color scale at the right over here um, for the number of grid points with SVP of one or greater. Um, Okay, so now the composite maps that you see popping up um, as I mouse over. These composite maps are generated for days when the uh, either one of these is met. The SCP is either five or greater for any one point, or there are 50 or more points of one or greater. And I think that's still 50, unless and no, I think that got bumped to 100 as well. Um, let's see here on the composite maps then. Yeah, let's select. Yeah, I want to select one of these now and just look at it specifically. So the, on the composite maps, each point with a daily average SCP of one or greater gets one of these little white dots. The isoplots then are areas of equal max SCP for the day. But again, keeping in mind that six-hour time step in the model. Um, the filled contours, the dark blues here are just a convective precept from the CFS, which to me I've thought just seems low most of the time, but maybe I'm viewing it as more of a total precept than just convective. Um, but the values often look kind of low to me. The table at the top then, um, this little table, summarizes the white dot count, which here is 231, the max SCP, um, which is 31.7 for today, and then the max total uh, convective precept here, pushing two inches. Okay, so going back to the parallelogram, you can also view uh, past forecasts, and if the criteria for generating a map are met, you can view the number of severe weather reports and where they occurred. So for this particular day, I'm looking at what? Uh, May 29th, and you can see a bunch of hail reports over Kansas. Somewhere in there, there's a red triangle with tornado. Um, what's kind of neat is you can see, you know, the, the quiet periods here, the more active periods here. Somewhere in here is, uh, well, it doesn't quite go back to April 26th. This was pretty busy. Um, but there's April 27th, and there are quite a few more tornadoes there. Um, let's see. The only other thing I wanted to point out about this site is at the bottom here, and I've not spent a lot of time with this, but it is the the prod BT of the last ten CFS forecasts for the next for the next ten days of uh, SCP counts of one or greater. Um, so I'll just kind of step through this, and it's it's a little busy. And then there's the nomogram, or I guess it's a nomogram um, bar chart uh, type deal there in the bottom right, again showing those uh, the last ten forecast for the next 10 days. Um, and it's, it's a little over, it looks a little overdone just because this time of year it's pretty easy, I think, to generate uh, SCP of one. Um, so it's maybe a little bit more limited value this time of year versus, say, April or May, um, just because the instability gets so high. Uh, all right, I think that's all I wanted to show on the very busy parallelogram page. Are there any questions? All right, I will roll back to my presentation. Oops. All right, there it is. And move on to the GFS deterministic trend site. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this site because it's fairly simple, but I found it to be helpful, particularly when there's considerable uncertainty in the min in the mid range. One thing I do like about this page is it's available shortly after the deterministic run is complete. 
um, the GFS, uh, and it's run after each GFS cycle. Essentially, they're taking the last 10 runs of the operational deterministic GFS and computing uh, weighted change rates. The background shadings in um, these purples and yellows and greens is the standard deviation. The blue dashed lines represent a trend towards lower heights, and then a red courses off to the higher heights. Um, and the units are in decameters per cycle. It site I found is fairly helpful when there is a considerable degree of uncertainty in the ensemble data. Um, when you're seeing spreads all over the place, spaghetti plot looks truly like spaghetti. This this site um, tends to become a little bit more valuable. This time of year, it may be a little slightly less valuable, just because the uh, you know the less less change, less flow. Um, but just looking here over the next uh, several periods and a few days. You can see that little short wave that's uh, moving across the northern plains. In general, you know, we see this. Whoops, see the. Uh, I'm pointing with my pen right now. I'm sure you can see that. Um, the red circle over Idaho and Montana. In general, it looks like that that particular short wave is uh, been weakening um, in a deprog DT sense. Um, and then we step further out. Um, with the little short wave that's progged to move across the central Rockies into the central plains and hopefully give Kentucky a little bit of rain. Um, again, I'm pointing with my pen and you should be able to see that. It's got uh, the dashed blue indicating the past several runs um, are trending slightly towards a, a little bit uh, deeper short wave, if you will. And then we'll just move out here over the next several runs. And again, it kind of has that trend of slightly deeper um, shortwave as it as it closes off and takes up residence over Paducah's area um, through day, what is that, about nine or so. Um, let's see what else I want to point out here. The, uh, oh, the other, other important thing to point out is the link to the training video. Um, it is a YouTube video put together by the Sue, who put most of this together, I think, uh, his name is, uh, and I'll probably mispronounce his last name, it's Paul Iniguez, um, who largely designed the site, and the video was very well done. It's a 13-minute video that explains um, how this, um, a little more detail than I've done here, uh, how to use the site and how, how the, the data are calculated. All right, I want to jump back to my presentation, and we'll move on to... Again, they might be the godfather of you know, threat guidance and analogs. And that is the St. Louis University SIPS analog. Um, this site is really easy to navigate. Um, there's a lot, lot there. Maybe easy to navigate the kind way to describe it because it's, there's so much data there, it's almost easy to get lost. But it's, it's presented in a, in a you know, very aesthetically pleasing manner. The tools are really useful when the inputs are good, but they depend heavily on the accuracy of the inputs because it's it's relying on the deterministic NAM through 60 hours and the deterministic GFS out through 14 days. Now, this guidance can add a degree of forecast confidence, I think, to relatively stable model solutions, particularly in the short term. But that's excluding day one. They start the part. They start the analog for 36 hours. However, when there's a large spread in the course corresponding ensemble data and or large run-to-run -run changes in the model solutions, the value of the SIPS analog may very well be diminished. So let's jump to this here. And OK, we have a little bit more data than when I came in earlier, because this is the time of data, the time of the day that the data do come in. Um, but I'd be pretty surprised if there aren't multiple folks on this call that have more experience in viewing the SIPS analogs than I do. So um, if anybody wants to jump in, I don't know. Um, and uh, take over or whatever, that's fine, but I'll, I'll try to do my best here. But if you want to point something out, please feel free to do so. The selection of the domain here at the top does indeed matter. I've seen and would continue to expect the impact graphics to change as you change domains. Um, I typically try to hit, because it's, it's you know just comparing the, um, it's trying to make the comparisons within that domain itself. Um, 
plains. So if the demand, if the uh, flow doesn't compare well, say over the southern plains, um, and yet you're expecting weather over the northern plains, it may not be the best one to select. So I always select the area that's you know of most interest. I usually tend to jump just to the uh, time period of most interest, but you can also start by jumping straight to the domain, which I'm going to go ahead and do here, um, and just quickly get an overview of what's expected. I'm going to reload this. See if we have, okay, if, if there's usually, um, if we're here about an hour or two later, you would see not only the 36-hour uh, forecast, but it, it would go out through, uh, ma -ma -ma -ma, I want to say five days. Um, so in this case, we're just going to look at the uh, forecast for tomorrow. So you can select one of the individual time periods, or you can jump in here and just take a quick look on um, the probability of having um, more than uh, one severe report um, for, again, tomorrow. Um, and it kind of highlights that area the SPC has in day two right now. But I want to jump to the time period itself, which gives a little bit more information. Now, you can take a look at any one of the individual analogs that has popped out through their processing and find out how closely the current forecast and that particular member align. So let's go ahead and select the one that ranks the highest in their scoring. And what I like to do is to pop them up side by side. And what's really cool is you can move these guys around. And for, again, for tomorrow, um, let's see, no, I've lost track of which one's which. I think the one on the left is the, uh, let's see, I think the one on the left is current. Yes, the one on the left is current. Um, let's get that 500 back. Just comparing the lower left here, the 500 millibar flow. The, you know, just from a eyeball point of view, it's, it's an okay comparison, but the analog it's comparing to has much, much stronger flow over the northern plains. So, I wouldn't put a lot of credence into this particular analog. Um, probably maybe a, a day you would want to look at a different one or look at the uh, conglomerate of it. Um, but it also, um, you can not just look at the 500 data, you can look at the, uh, compare the instability to the two. Um, and I'm not going to delve into this, but just so you know that all of those are there. Um, but I, what I usually do, again, is jump to the most interesting time um, and then to the hazard guidance. And before I do that, there's good stuff in the, analog, the analysis guidance, too, including uh, Jeff Siwas stuff. Hopefully this will pop up, because sometimes the Siwas stuff is, is empty on here, and I don't know exactly why. But again, this is looking at tomorrow, the probability of having Siwas of greater than uh, 65? Yeah, 65 in this particular graphic. Um, and what's interesting is that I think the uh, I think the uh, current day two has this kind of little bimodal type thing um, across the northern plains. And the analogs seem to be kind of identifying that as well. I find that kind of interesting. Um, so you can then look at the uh, severe, the uh, hazard guidance probability of one severe report, which we were looking at just a little bit ago. Again, that little bimodal thing there. Um, and look at, let's see, let's look at probability of one tornado. Um, so highlighting Grand Forks area. But again, value is not terribly high. And as you might notice, uh, they're in the upper left of the graphics it does spit out the actual percentage, which is a recent change they've made. So it's kind of handy. Um, of course, you can look at the precip off of here. Um, perhaps a decent precip event for Duluth area. Um, for those of us down here in the uh, warm areas, we can check out the probability of heat index of over 95. Um, and unfortunately, pretty darn warm. So, um, valuable for when you get into you know the, the frost and freeze season for lower than 32. And I think they have a 28 on there as well. Or may that be just be an extended guidance. Um, within the thumbnails, you can look at the uh, practically perfect uh, SPC values. Um, and if there's one particular uh, member here that looks interesting to you, you can pop that up and load that. 
and think, okay, you know, that's maybe closer to what I expect tomorrow to be, even though I don't know that Michigan's really all that much under threat tomorrow. Um, and if that looks the case, then you could go look at the individual member uh, and do that comparison thing again. Okay, I've kind of sped through the, the slew data because there's still a few more slides I want to jump to. Are there any questions about the slew data before I jump back to the presentation? All right, I know I'm going through this pretty quickly, but we'll keep on moving. Um, the next site I want to just, and this is going to be pretty brief because I think people have pretty good appreciation for these already. Um, if there's anything to point out, it's probably how the collective members sometimes can be multimodal, as in my example here. Um, this is from a while back, but um, this one ended up looking almost trimodal, which you know might suggest some caution, if nothing else. Um, I, I'm not going to go to the SPC site because I think most people have used that quite a bit. One that might be slightly lesser used is the uh, EMC plot. And looks like somebody is going to have a pre-tip here over the next several days. That could be Valentine. One of the things I like about this site is that you can um, adjust your time frames. If you say, okay, there's nothing going on here over the next 48-ish hours for Valentine or so. And I'll just trim that up just a little bit more. It uh, expands a little bit so you can see it better. And another thing you can do is say, you know, I'm really more interested in this. These uh, this greater precip event, so I want to zero out this first, you know, half inch or so. So let's pull that left frame in just a little bit, and then you can select this uh, start accumulated QPF at zero, and see exactly what it's generating for just that particular event. So that's kind of handy. And of course, there's multiple variables on here as well, um, and you can control over the x and y axes too. So that is pretty straightforward. Um, I think that's all I want to point out there. Let's jump back to the presentation and move on to Mars. I almost didn't include the Mars in output because it seems a little basic and has some limitations as the SPC advises on the page itself. The idea is that they run a low resolution GIF ensemble, GFS ensemble that includes weighted time lags from prior GFS deterministic and ensemble runs. The Mars uses that ensemble mean for three components, the 500 millibar height gradient here in the upper right, the 850 millibar height gradient in the lower left, and precipitable water to determine its overall analog in the upper left. The practically perfect forecasts are created um, then from the SPC reports database from 1979 through 2004 for the respective analogs. Um, and then only the top four matches are used. So let's go to the site and it loads the next, let's see, I think uh, 10 days or seven. Um, anyway, I'll step through that and this would be today. And again, the practically perfect forecast. Um, for the Northern Plains and then the tomorrow, which again, I think is very interesting how it becomes a little bit bimodal. Um, the PWAT, in this case, probably uh, contributing the most to that. Um, to just step through it over the next week or so, there's that little shortwave that comes out uh, for us here in the Central Plains. Um, again, looks like pretty high PWAT, so we'll be enjoying those lovely dew points. Um, Again, it's kind of a, just a quick way to look at your weather chances over the next week. Um, I don't want to call it a crude site, but you know it's low enough resolution um, that it, it does it, you know, it pretty much blows away any chance of seeing any meta, meta scale data. But still, a, a nice little valuable way to look at it. Okay, I have one more site I want to jump to. Let's jump back to my presentation, and that's the Incar Ensemble. And this is one of those save the best for last type things. It is a ten member three kilometer convection allowing ensemble prediction system using a data simulation system that utilizes a continuously cycled uh, ensemble adjustment Kalman, Kalman filter. The primary benefit of that, if I understand it correctly, is that the in-car ensemble, this, this in-car ensemble, 
doesn't have to depend on external models for its initial conditions, only the boundary conditions, which I think is a pretty big key. They also note a bias correction benefit by using uh, the, that particular data assimilation method. There's a December 2015 WAF paper that describes the guts of the ensemble in much, much greater detail and better detail than I have here. So if anybody wants that, just let me know and I can send it to you. Or you can search for it, too. Um, I don't have anything to really back this up, but I suspect we probably should be devoting more time and attention to the output of this ensemble. It, it, it has really been pretty good from what, what I've seen so far. Um, so let's jump to the site itself. And, okay, good. We have the zero the, uh, from the tenth here. First, of course, jumps up on the ensemble mean 48-hour uh, precip. The menus I'm going to step through. The surface and precip menu has, you know, what most of what you would expect, plus maybe a little bit more. It has the ensemble mean as well as the max. Let's just jump to the uh, ensemble mean accumulated uh, precip here and step through. And this is R by R that's accumulated. Um, so it hits our multiple events there across the northern plain. Um, let's see what else I want to show on there. You can see the individual uh, members in postage stamps. Um, so the, each of the each of the ten individual members there, and that's the uh, composite reflectivity from each of those. Um, let's see what else. Oh, the uh, where is that? The ensemble plume. Um, they have their own plumes page, which is uh, has a lot more uh, points than most of the the uh, plume sites that you'll see. But again, it's only it's only 48 hours worth of data. Um, let's see. Okay, after the plumes, I wanted to jump to oh the uh, paintball, which is it's just basically a term for a, it's kind of a collage of the output for each member where it produces. Uh, 40 dB or greater. Um, and you'll see that paintball thing used a lot in the hourly max menu. So let's just step through this, and each color then is just you know each one of the individual members. Um, so this is this is basically now, well now, <laughs> um, which kind of hits the stuff weak stuff going on in Minnesota. And interestingly, I looked at the radar before I started this. It even uh, hits the you know the, the stuff going on in South Dakota too. So it again this this model is pretty good, or the, the ensemble rather is is pretty good. So then we step through uh, tonight, and then into the overnight hours, and then late tomorrow afternoon gets going again. So um, okay, let's move. Oh, one more thing under here. The uh, composite and reflectivity and updraft velocity viewer. Now it pops into the ability to separate it into day one and day two. I generally just jump to the 48 hour thing. Um, the uh, contours then are uh, where the updraft velocity exceeds 50. Um, and it's just another way to look at the probability of sphere over the next 48 hours. Scan through this real quickly as we <laughs> hopefully close. Um, okay, I'm not going to sit there and wait on it. Um, but I will do want to move on now to the upper air menu. And there's much, again, what you might expect, um, plus a simulated uh, satellite stuff. And I found these to be pretty good. Um, I have this in my notes that it's very good, but I had to downgrade that to good today because of the uh, NCS that it kind of overproduced for this morning. Granted, there are <clears throat> there are storms up there, but no, nothing quite like the NCS that it, it tries to depict here. But overall, I've found I've found days where this is I mean it's almost frighteningly good. Um, and it's got a, a uh, water vapor there as well. Let's see anything else I want to point out there. Probably not a lot of sense in looking at the winter menu. Um, but it might be a good time to point out that they keep a crazy amount of data on this uh, site. Um, the last time I looked, there had over a year's worth of past forecasts in there. 
I went back and looked at the uh, ensemble output for the late December flooding on the Mississippi. And I, it was just a quick glance, but it, su it suggested it handled those crazy values pretty well. Um, so it may be a tool to aid in research and training. Um, the severe menu uh, has a lot of examples to expect. Um, if there's anything else, someone can pop up the, uh, you know, the SIG tour. Um, and again, this is the ensemble max um, for the next 48 hours. So values, you know, they're worth looking at. Um, tomorrow's data. Let's see, is there anything else I want to show out here? Um, oh, probability of having uh, SRH over a certain value. Um, it gets a little bit loud, maybe for 100, load 300. Where did it go? Oh, uh, there it is. So obviously that's a little bit less, but highlighting the overnight hours in Eastern Montana, Western South Dakota. Um, anything else in the severe wind menu I want to look at? The hourly max menu uh, contains a lot of information. Again, has uh, some of the paintball stuff um, from the individual, for the plot of the individual numbers. There's also the neighborhood probabilities for multiple severe weather categories. Um, then there are these various uh, severe threshold uh, hail forecasting approaches. The, uh, let's see, where did it go? It's hidden a little bit by my, I'm going to minimize my screen here. I'm having trouble reaching it with the uh, controls here over on the right. But it has this, uh, come on, baby, there it is. Um, it has this. I think it's Gagne Hale. I don't know. There's been two baseball players that I've known without the past name and pronounced it differently, but I think he pronounces it Gagne. Um, it is based upon an OU uh, PhD student dissertation that used a physics based column hail growth model that is called a uh, hail cast um, that they claim gets better results than the Thompson uh, microphysics scheme. He uses a linear regression approach and decision tree ensemble that I think are employed to generate the values that I'll, that I'll show here. So let's go ahead and load that, load that. Let's look at it in, let's do a neighborhood prob. Let's create it a one inch. Um, and I've not seen huge differences between the, the Gagne Hale and the, the uh, Thompson here, but again, they're, they're definitely worth comparing. The value is not real high. In fact, they're fairly low for the next 48 hours. Um, let's just for grins, let's look at the uh, Thompson Hale for that same time frame. Yeah, I have it probably. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so again, value is not real high for late today into tonight. And then they jump up just a little bit late tomorrow. So nothing terribly impressive. The uh, lightning data, just another way to look basically with reflectivity. I don't know the difference between the lightning one, two, and three. Um, and I've not seen a huge difference between the two. But I'm, I'm sure there's a difference in how they're calculating. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. Um, let's see. Is there anything else I wanted to point out? Oh, yeah. The uh, day one and two severe weather probabilities is kind of interesting. Um, divides it up into day one and two for just you know, the two 24 hour periods. And you get the probabilities of these various uh, parameters here updraft velocity greater than 75, SIG tor greater than one, which is you know, a decent area. Um, so to thin that out a little bit, you can look at SIG tor greater than three. And then same for day two. And what's interesting then is you can also pop the uh, SPC, latest SPC forecast over that. So it's a very interesting way to compare, you know, looking at the SIG tour greater than three and the SPC forecast as well. So that's, that's a neat little tool that they've added there. Okay. Are there any questions about the NCAR ensemble page? All right. Uh, yes, there's. Oh, um, just a second. Uh, Ray, you had you had a comment. Let's see. 
Let's see if we got Ray Wolf. You have you had a comment. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you hear me, John? Sure can. Loud and clear. Okay. I'm just going to say we've been looking at this pretty consistently this spring, and uh, seen some outstanding, flat out outstanding forecasts from it, including the tornado outbreak we had back in March. And even uh, yesterday morning, it hit that warm advection wing really well, which isn't too surprising because it was decently forced. But it also uh, pretty well nailed this uh, cellular type convection that developed behind it during the morning. I mean, that's a, a level of detail I wouldn't expect models to uh, typically hit. But this one is really, really, it's one of my go-to products. To look at for sure. Thanks, Ray. All right, anybody else? All right, well, that was really all I had other than jump, jumping to my conclusion page. There are some tools that I didn't cover. Um, Ezreal does some extreme percentile plot. I've not looked at them much at all. Um, they're out there. Of course, then there's the uh, Sheref products from SPC. Um, and something I was kind of grown fond of uh, that was run for a particular project, that uh, MPAS, MPS, MPAS, but I believe it was also from uh, NCAR. Um, that was run out 120 hours, I think. It was very similar to the NCAR Ensemble, um, and it was producing you know, very good output as well. It was, run, it was like a hexagonal type uh, grid point type thing. It was very, very, very interesting. But a uh, high resolution, good, good ensemble output. Um, any other questions? Oh, oh, I know one other thing I should show. I can find it, and I haven't been logged out of, of uh, Silly V Lab. Um, let's see. Where is that? Is that it? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so the, uh, for the what I have under the forecast links right now is uh, I haven't taken any of these out yet. I will take just this long list out soon because what I've turned it into is the table below. Um, highlighting uh, each one of the sites that I've presented here. Um, the source, the description, the uh, duration, kind of kind of a la what Western Region has done. Um, they have a similar page um, that I think we have links to on here. Um, I've tried to keep it maybe just a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to use, but they have a lot of information on there that some of which I probably won't incorporate onto this page. So. Any other questions before we wrap up? And I don't see any uh, written in. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining and listening to me babble on for 53 minutes. I hope it was valuable. And if you have any, think of any questions later, just drop me a line. All right. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.